Hey guys, I'm taking a short break for the new year. In the meantime, enjoy this fantastic video by the YouTube channel How to Beat Anime. Definitely check them out in the link in the description. You're stuck in four deadly gambling games, and you have to bet your eyes, ears, and fingers to get rid of your debt and survive. What do you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat Kaiji, Ultimate Survivor. This man is about to lose everything. Kaiji here is a drunk and spends his day gambling away everything he owns and then goes home crying about it. He's got no job and no goals, so he takes out his frustration by vandalizing nice cars. But he doesn't realize that he's about to get invited to play in four games that will change his life. Hearing a knock on the door, this creepy guy in a trench coat invites himself in. Kaiji bumps his bookshelf and drops a bag full of stolen car emblems, leading the man to figure out that Kaiji is the one who vandalized his car. Taking him away, the man in the trench coat tells Kaiji that he's not going to pay for the damages because he's got a much bigger problem to deal with. When they get to his office, the man then tells him that Kaiji's old co-worker Furuhata has suddenly disappeared and left a massive debt behind and Kaiji then realizes that he's made the biggest mistake of his sweet life. Kaiji signed as his co-worker's guarantor on the debt, which means that we with Furuhata now gone, Kaiji is now the one who owes the money. He's screwed. But being the bumbling oaf that he is, Kaiji thinks he's A-OK -okay because the debt he signed was just for 300,000 yen until the detective happily corrects him thanks to one small detail that Kaiji missed. Compound interest. Which means, with a compound interest of 20% per month over 14 months, the debt is actually 3.85 million yen. This means that it'll take Kaiji 11 years to pay it off, and the detective threatens him that if he doesn't pay the debt, they will get it from his family by any means necessary. But the man in the trench coat offers him one small ray of hope. If Kaiji can make it out alive. He tells him there's a cruise ship leaving in a month's time, with the possibility of one night's work on that ship being able to rid him of his debts and even potentially make some money in the process. But nothing is as it seems, because hundreds of other down-on-their-luck players will be competing for a chance to get rid of their crippling debts too. And if you win, you're free to go debt-free, and possibly with even more money than you could ever realize. But if you lose, you'll have to work off the losses for a year or two. But Kaiji isn't sold on the idea just yet and is suspicious. But that's when the man in the trench coat makes a call and tells Kaiji that there are only two slots remaining, so he better decide fast. Then he gets another call and says that there's only one slot left and then suddenly no more slots are available. Kaiji is so caught off guard that he begins to beg to be let on that ship and he's eating right out of the palm of this guy's hand. The man then agrees and helps sign Kaiji's life away until one month later, when Kaiji finally gets on the ship named Espoir, and the first game, out of four, finally begins. <sighs> okay, Kaiji here just fell for the oldest trick in the book. Like the saying goes, there's a sucker born every minute, and right now that's Kaiji. Not only did he just sign a contract without reading it, the phone call the man in the trench coat received was obviously fake. The detective here is using a sales tactic to create a sense of urgency in Kaiji's head. You've probably had this done to you at some point in your life right? Whenever you see a timer on a flash sale online, or a product that's limited edition with a small amount of stock and you have to buy it before it's too late. That, my friends, is an ingenious way of creating a sense of urgency, and it forces you to act on emotions rather than logic. And that's exactly what Trenchcoat here wants Kaiji to do. Rush decisions that you make based on emotion are almost always worse than if you took a deep breath and a step back to look at the situation logically. Kaiji here just rushed to beg and signed the contract to ruin his life and said thank you when they let him. But the psychological manipulation goes even deeper than that. The ship's name Espoir means hope in French. The detective tells Kaiji that he's lucky to have this opportunity and that it's actually a good thing that this happened to him. He's preying on Kaiji's frustration at the world and his situation and convinces him that it's not his fault his life is like this. And if he had enough money, he would be a much better person. In reality, they should have called the ship abattoir, which is French translated to slaughterhouse. The good news is, there's one silver lining. The fact that all of this psychological manipulation is necessary in the first place also proves to us that we can still get away if we don't fall for the tricks being used on us. If Kaiji here was thinking straight, he would have realized that he was being manipulated. 
Looks aren't everything, but this man in the trench coat is clearly a dirty loan shark with ties to the Yakuza. It's even possible that he's working together with Kaiji's old co-worker and that the whole thing has been a scam from the very start to get Kaiji to pay up instead. Even though Trenchcoat is threatening Kaiji's family, this is the exact moment Kaiji can get out, contact the police, get an aid lawyer which work for free in Japan I might add, and make himself too much of a hassle to be worth scamming. If you think about it, Kaiji is not the primary owner on the loan. He has no previous connections to Trenchcoat and he's dead broke with no job. Loan sharking is illegal in Japan and Trenchcoat here is likely going to see Kaiji is more trouble than he's worth once he doesn't agree to go on the ship. Even if he ends up having to pay the original 300,000 yen debt, that's one month's work on average in Japan instead of 11 years. And that's a whole lot better. That's why he needed to manipulate Kaiji in the first place. All of this means that Kaiji is about to be involved in something more evil than he could ever imagine. Walking inside, Kaiji is greeted by dozens of other sad sacks just like him. Suddenly, men in suits bust in and announce that they'll be lending out something called war funds to be used in the first game. Every person here has the option to take out anywhere from 1 to 10 million yen. However, this money comes with a catch. Compound interest. Shit. Not this again. Every 10 minutes, whatever is taken out will increase by a compounding interest of 1.5%. With the cruise lasting 4 hours, the players will owe an extra 40% at the end. The gamblers freak the hell out at the crazy news, but the suited man tells them that they're free to leave right now, right back to their sad, worthless lives. And that shuts them up. He tells them that taking the gamble is a much better option than having to pay off their debt for the next 10 to 20 years. And they think he's right. The gamblers start taking out loans of 1 million, and that's when this crazy bastard called Funai walks to the front of the group and takes out the upper limit of 10 million yen, much to everyone's surprise. Not knowing what's to come, Kaiji here decides to take out the exact same amount to increase his chances of winning. Their fates are now sealed, and the ship begins to leave the port. The gamblers are then taken to the gambling hall, and the hall master Tonagawa finally introduces them to the first game that they'll be playing, a game very familiar to every single person in the room and the world. Opening a set of envelopes, everyone is shocked. The game to determine whether or not they'll stay in crippling debt is rock paper, scissors, with a twist. Everyone is given four cards of each hand, meaning they'll have 12 cards in total, and each of these cards can only be used once. Opening another envelope, the gamblers are then given a set of three stars, which they must attach to their jacket. And here's how the game works. Two gamblers must agree to compete with each other. Once agreed upon, they say check, lay their card down on the table, and say set. And lastly, open. If the cards are the same, no stars are given, but if there is a winner, one star is given up by the loser. Every participant must use all of their 12 given cards, and the gamblers at the end of the 4 hours with 3 stars or more will be victorious. Those with 2 or less stars or those who haven't used all 12 of their cards in time will be considered the loser. Kaiji and another man ask him what the money is for, and what will happen if they lose, but the hall master refuses to answer and tells them to focus on winning. He knows that the losers will experience a fate worse than death. The game then begins. Okay, if you've been watching Cinema Summary long enough, including their other Kaiji video, and by the way, the anime is way more brutal and has an extra bonus death game at the end that they didn't include in the movie, just want to point that out, then you already know that at the start of the game, it is time to analyze your surroundings. Or is it disrespect your surroundings? Nope, that's a song. Moving on. Once again, it's absolutely crucial that we don't make any emotional decisions. Rather, we need to think logically instead and see what we can take take advantage of for our own personal gain. The first thing to notice is, is that most players will act on their emotions and rush to play their cards as fast as possible. And that's because with 1.5 interest ticking up every 10 minutes, the faster they finish playing, the less interest they'll accumulate. Makes perfect sense, right? The other reason they're going to rush is because everyone here has the same type of personality. Most, if not everyone, ended up here because of bad financial decisions, and they're about to dig themselves into a deeper hole they'll never come out of. They haven't realized it yet, but the players have already undergone a very careful selection process to identify their deadbeat personality types. The participants here are the types of people that are highly gullible, believing that a simple card, dice, or a game can fix their financially ruined lives. These men are all 
hopeful that they'll make it out of here with more money than they can ever spend. A classic gambler mindset. What they don't realize is that failure is a very possible situation and many of their dreams are about to be crushed in only a few minutes. These idiot uh, people all boarded a ship in international waters. From there, the laws of the country they're currently in no longer apply. Yet somehow, they still expect these games to be fair. They can't bear the thought of working to pay their debts over the next 10 to 20 years. So they're willing to throw their life away in return for no guarantees whatsoever. Despite no one answering their questions, they still agree to play. See what I mean by gullible? What this means for us is that we can take advantage of this in the same way the game designers are. By knowing these players' way of thinking and waiting it out, the cost we pay in interest is going to pay off many times over by the opportunities it opens up for us. For example, when we watch other players play, some will use up all four of just one type of card. Once they run out of that card, they can't use it again, and that means that then we can play against them with no chance of losing. If we wait even longer, we might even see someone who used up two types of cards completely, and when they're left with only one type of card, we can play against them for a guaranteed win. It's such a simple solution that protects your life, but if you rush into play, you'll miss it completely. Kaiji here notices that someone has already lost three of their stars, and it hasn't even been ten minutes yet. The players around him aren't taking the game seriously, and they don't realize what will happen if they lose. And that's when Funai here strikes up a conversation with Kaiji, telling him that the truth is, the players here are gambling with their lives. He tells him that the losers of this game will be forced to do messed up shit like forced labor to be used as lab rats for horrifying drug experiments. Then he explains what the money is for. Once people realize what will happen to them if they lose, each star will be worth a few million. Funai tells Kaiji that they can't risk losing and has an idea for them to team up to ensure that they win. Since you only need three stars at the end, and they both already started with three stars, if you were to draw with someone until all 12 of your cards are used, you'd both end up as winners. Losing is not an option, and they need to be ready to do everything in order to survive. By working together, they can ensure with 100% certainty that they both use up all of their cards while keeping all three stars. Agreeing, the two play a game, and it's all going swimmingly well until they're only a few cards away from completing the game. But that's when Funai screws Kaiji over big time and draws the wrong card, taking one of Kaiji's stars. Funai promises him that it was a mistake, but on this ship you can't trust anyone. And Funai draws another card, showing Kaiji that this was no mistake. As Kaiji draws paper and Funai draws scissors, meaning that Funai beats Kaiji and takes another one of his precious stars away from him. Funai reveals that this is his second time on this ship and tells Kaiji that he practiced how to hide two cards on top of each other before entering the ship, demonstrating to Kaiji just how much of a sneaky sleazeball he truly is. Now Kaiji only has one star left, which causes him to freak his face off and tries to attack Funai before the guards break it up. Funai then calls Kaiji an idiot for being tricked and the guards threaten to kick Kaiji out if he keeps this up. He has to find a way to survive with just one star and one card left. What is with these guys? Okay, Funai here is what you call a repeater, meaning from the very beginning he was looking for prey and good guy Kaiji here fit the bill. His trustworthiness is a completely useless trait in a game amongst people like this. And if someone approaches you because you look trustworthy, you can be darn near certain that their only intention is to take advantage of you. Earlier when analyzing the game, we could have figured out for ourselves that there are players here with more experience than others. Let's look at the odds of the rock paper scissors game. About half of the players here are going to win and the other half are going to lose. We can deduce that some winners will come back to play a second time with existing knowledge of the game. If they won before and returned to the game, then those players are the predators and they came back to play again because they are on the lookout for prey. Now, if Kaiji had realized this before, it would have given him the easiest win possible. If he realized what Funai was doing and played dumb, he could have taken a star on the very first card played. The first card they both agreed to play was scissors and the one guarantee Kaiji has right now is that Funai thinks he's a sucker. Kaiji had the chance to immediately play rock on the first draw, taking the star and letting Funai go scam someone else. You know for a guy who hates his life and vandalizes cars a lot, his willingness to trust complete strangers is his biggest mistake. But ironically, if he could play up his gullible nature, it can give him a competitive edge. If we look at Kaiji's situation right now, he's down one star and one card. Even if he wins his next game, he'll only have two stars which means he won't make it onto the upper level of the ship. Strategically, he's doomed. He's hit rock bottom and lost all hope. And this is where the show really shines. Crying and hating himself for his mistakes, this anime is called Ultimate Survivor for a reason because Kaiji always 
always finds a way to survive no matter how bad the situation is, and we're about to see how. That's when he notices someone very familiar. This green sweater man was his co-worker Furuhata, who got Kaiji into debt and this situation in the first place. Chasing him down, Kaiji follows him into the break room, but is shocked by the dozens of depressed men that are in there and are about to lose. He then pulls Furuhata out of the break room and back into hell itself, telling him to stay here or else he'll lose for sure. Furuhata has only one star, but he has four cards, and Kaiji needs him to survive. They agree to team up, and Kaiji says they only need one more player on their team. The two go back into the hall, find a man named Ando with two stars and no cards, who I might add is in an even worse situation than our boys. Gathering them together, Kaiji tells them to stop working as individuals and start working as a team. Combining their assets, they now have four stars, five cards, along with 14 million yen in total. But on the toilet, Furuhata mentions that he just made a massive mistake. He gave one of the cards to Ando. Ando immediately betrays them trying to win a star with the card and losing on the spot. Now their situation is even worse, and not only do they have three stars and four cards, all four of the cards are scissors, and even if they won every game, they still wouldn't have enough to survive. Ando screwed them without a second thought. Everyone on this boat is out for themselves. But Kaiji decides to let him still stay on the team, and he finds a way for them to survive. Together, they find someone that they can win against. This guy has nine cards, and he just used rock, then scissors, leaving him now with seven cards remaining. Analyzing the man, Kaiji realizes that this mysterious person is the kind that keeps his deck perfectly balanced, which means he has two rock and two scissors, and three paper cards left. And in the next card game, he'll play paper. Kaiji challenges him, and the results prove Kaiji's theory. The man throws down paper, meaning Kaiji wins a single star. But it's not over yet, because Kaiji Kaiji asks the man for one more round and he agrees, throwing down a rock this time. Kaiji loses the star he just won and walks away, but the gambler wants more. The other two tell Kaiji to back down, that they can find someone else, but Kaiji lets them in that this was part of his plan, losing the second game on purpose in order to get two straight wins. He plays another game, and because his opponent thinks there's no way he'll play another three straight scissors in a row, he plays paper again and Kaiji wins back the star. Now the man is obsessed. He believes in balance so much that he refuses to believe Kaiji will play a fourth scissors card. He challenges him a final time, and with his fourth scissors card, Kaiji wins again. They now have five stars, but no cards, and the group has to find a way to get four more stars to survive. Okay, reading this guy perfectly was pretty brilliant by Kaiji, but also completely unnecessary. Not only is there a much better way he could have gotten the stars he needed, Furuhata and Anto here are a liability, and both of them have already proven that they would betray him in a heartbeat the moment they get a chance. Kaiji stuck in debt in the first place because of Furuhata, and as soon as Ando was given a card, he tried to screw them over for his own sake. Instead of taking a risk reading another man's psychology, which he did great by the way, Kaiji has a way here to get his stars much more easily, and it has everything to do with this room of desperate men. Just like Ando here, there are more players to be found with two stars but no cards left. They know they're going to lose because they need cards in order to survive. The thing is, they don't realize cards are really easy to get. Just like the rules explained in the beginning of the game, we saw if you just get rid of all of your cards and keep your three stars, you win. That means players like Kaiji and Funai based their whole strategy just on trying to get rid of their cards. We can easily convince another player to give us their cards, because that gives them an easy win. If we use this strategy to get cards for free, we can go around finding more players like Ando with two stars and no cards and selling them cards in return for one star, and a good percentage of them will agree to it because it gives them a chance at survival. These are not your average players. Most people who got tricked into coming onto the boat in the first place. And the fact that many of them are desperate means that we can use their situation to gain an advantage for ourselves. Now that he's got three stars himself, Kaiji should really ditch these two for good. If it were me, I would give them another player to look for and quickly inform the guards that I've got no more cards left, quickly advance upstairs and forget about this horrible mess of a situation. No one wins in this life without stepping on a few toes, and these guys should have known better than to team up with a stranger in a game of debt. Worrying about your own life is pretty dang useful, but adding two others to the equation is even worse. 
However, without any cards, they can't play any games. And that's when Kaiji comes up with the ultimate winning strategy. Looking at the scoreboard, he notices that there are fewer paper cards left than the other types. That's when he realizes that if they collect rock cards and wait until the paper cards run out, they can keep playing and winning without risking their stars. He sends Furuhata and Ando out to collect 30 rock cards and a few other types as spares as well, using some of the money that they have. And they go hide in the bathroom to wait for the paper cards to run out. Their plan is to not only to win, but to earn so many stars that they leave the ship rich overnight. Except that's when the plan backfires on them spectacularly. Looking at the giant monitor, they notice something horrifying. They notice that the scissors cards are dropping faster than a fly out of breath, and the paper cards stop being used at all. Kaiji tells them to just wait patiently. However, for some reason, they notice the weirdest thing. The scissors are not only dropping, but dropping in pairs, unlike the other cards. Meaning that someone else figured out their plan and has targeted them. They're hoarding paper cards, causing scissors to disappear in pairs, meaning that people are using them in games to draw with each other. Ando and Furuhata freak out and rush to play a game before the scissors come out. But they both immediately lose their extra stars. And now the team is down to one single star each again. Kaiji here is then approached by this long-haired man and two other guys who just took their stars. Turns out they heard about their plan and now they're being blackmailed to buy their stars for 5 million yen each or lose the game. Kaiji refuses but offers to play in-game for three stars, everything their team has. He drops all of his cash right on the table, telling the man that they'll bet three stars and six million yen in one game. The man agrees, and Kaiji reads him perfectly. He sees the man pull out a card from his jacket and guesses perfectly what happened. The team hoarded one paper cards too many, and it's in his jacket because he needs to get rid of it. Kaiji plays scissors, and they win back three stars, bringing them back up to six, needing just three more. Okay, restricted rock, paper, scissors is not not only a game of strategy, but also of psychological wit. Looking at this situation, we can see that Kaiji egged the man on to make him lose his cool, thereby losing the game. One of the most important things that Kaiji did was betting such a crazy amount of money and stars. Since rock, paper, scissors is such a simple game, the amount of strategy within the card game alone is pretty limited. That's why you need to think outside of the box to make sure you maximize your chances of winning. When Kaiji and his team hoarded rock cards, they realized that they need to get an even number. Number. That way they can always play against each other to draw and get rid of the cards. But if the number of rock cards they got wasn't even, then they would have had one card they would have to get rid of. When the man pulled the card out of the jacket, Kaiji knew it must be the type of card they were hoarding. But he didn't give that information away. Oh no no no. What he did was insanely smart. And by betting three stars, it gave the long haired man a false sense of confidence to take all three of Kaiji's group down at once. For us, it's all or nothing. But for them, they'll still have a few stars left over if they were to have lost, which they did, making them act carelessly like fools when approaching this round of rock, paper, scissors. Kaiji here should have acted more like a man who was hopeless and who thought he had little chance of winning. This game of rock, paper, scissors can be thought as a game of poker, because as with poker, at least two-thirds of the time, any hand you are dealt will be unimproved on the flop, which are the first three cards that are dealt face up on the board. That means that most of the time, bluffing will be the only way you come out on top, and why poker is much less about having good cards than it is about knowing how to get away with a good lie. Kaiji here could have done a little bit more to make it seem as though he had truly no chance of winning, or at the very least believed that he didn't. Such as acting out some of the classic telltale signs of someone who's bluffing, such as the constant jittering of his hand, touching the face, the unnatural overprotecting of cards from being seen by his opponent, and major sudden changes in posture. Incorporating some of these false moves could have lulled his opponent into even more into thinking he had Kaiji dead to rights. All all without being overly critical of his own moves before making them. Just like I said, this is a game of psychological wit, and all it takes is one wrong card dealt to win or lose a match. Which is why Kaiji should have committed even further into tricking this man, by using physiological signs of someone who's a nervous wreck. After the game, Kaiji approaches the long-haired man and tries to sneakily convince him to give his paper cards away by threatening to tell everyone his hoarding paper card secret. Offering 2 million yen, he nips all 10 of his paper cards into his deck, giving the group 30 rock, 5 scissors, and 34 paper cards. Kaiji here then tells the others to split up for the time being, while they wait for the perfect time to use all of their cards. Suddenly, a familiar face shows up, rotten scumbag Funai himself. He sits down next to Kaiji and tells him to scan the room, where gamblers with only one or two stars and no cards 
guards remaining have gathered. The guards have told them that the stars will be up for sale after the game ends. So this group of losers will be trying to buy the cards, putting everyone into even deeper debt even if they manage to get three stars. And that's when Funai reveals to Kaiji what he fears most, that he knows about him hoarding cards. Funai then demands that Kaiji hands them over, since he knows the final cards that a few of the gamblers already have, offering a star in return and tells him to ditch his two friends. But Kaiji refuses. Later in the bathroom, Kaiji reminds the others to not betray him and gives them both 2 million yen, so he can't run away either. Now they only need 3 more stars in order to win. But Kaiji doesn't realize that these friends of his are about to try and ruin his life. The trio then goes back into the gambling hall and finds out that no one wants to play. It's the final hour of the game and no one wants to risk losing near the end. 17 minutes now remain and Funai here makes a suggestion that they gather all the cards of the remaining plays and reshuffle them, restarting everyone's decks since most know what cards they have. Convinced? Most of the players agree to this. Now, everyone but Kaiji's group have formed into their own group, shuffling the cards and planning to only play amongst themselves. With no one else to play with, Kaiji reluctantly agrees to join in. Everyone throws down their cards, but that's when they realize something is off. They're missing three cards. Looking over at the group of people that have given up, they realize that one of them is holding on to three scissor cards, but they decide to let it go for now. Reshuffling the cards, Fanai throws Kaiji's cards into the air, forcing them to pick it up and lose valuable time. Okay, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice though, shame on you. This was an obvious power play by Funai, and based on how he pulled a fast one on us earlier, this means that everything he does is according to plan. The man can't be trusted, well neither can we, but that's besides the point. Everyone else should have known this by now. If I were Kaiji, I would try and convince everyone that Funai is a fraud and not to be trusted. However, he already has the last remaining people in the palm of his hands, so there's not many options we can take to prove that he's a dirty cheater. Thinking back a few hours ago, we know from personal experience that Funai is pretty damn good when convincing people that he's a trustworthy guy. Now, noticing that he's taking control of the situation and the other schmucks are following along, it's our responsibility to let everyone know that this guy is full of shit. Since everyone's agreed to shuffle their cards, there's no stopping that. However, Funai is a veteran of the game and there's many things you can do to a deck of cards while shuffling it. He's probably done this party trick before multiple times, whether on this ship or some other shady gambling den. Kaiji should speak up and suggest that everyone gets a turn to shuffle the cards. That way, we reduce the chances of the cards being tampered with. However, that's not all. Dirty cheaters are some of the smartest people in the world, like me, but that's besides the point. Kaiji should have made sure that everyone takes a very close inspection of every card they've been given. Look out for blemishes, cuts, and other oddities. There's no time left to waste, and Kaiji then challenges a random man to a duel, but is interrupted by Funai, telling the man that Kaiji knows how to predict what card he'll have, since he's the one hoarding cards. The man then declines Kaiji's offer, causing Kaiji to start swinging in anger at Funai. The guards break the two kids up, and that's when Funai messes up big time. He reveals that he's been setting the man up for failure all along. This causes Kaiji to call on the whole room and ask if they've lost to Funai since reshuffling, and one man comes forward, knowing that Funai cheated and explained why, accusing him of putting a scratch mark on each type of card he wanted, and he shows everyone proof of this. After marking them, Funai gave scissors to all of his targets and rock cards to himself. He also shuffled the cards and gave them out in random order, instead of going clockwise to make sure he was giving out the marked scissor cards. Funai is an even bigger scumbag than Kaiji thought. This causes everyone to leave Funai alone, but the madness isn't over yet. Kaiji's group still needs to win three games in order to progress to the next round. Round. And with no options left, he calls over all the remaining players to play with him with a catch. In order to make it fair, Kaiji shuffles one card of rock, paper, and scissors and lines them up, giving everyone else the option to pick which card he gets to play. The men agree, and Kaiji gets to play the first game out of three. Opening their cards, the first man kicks the bucket, while the next two win. However, it's not important, because this is all a part of his sneaky plan to reach Funai. Kaiji then challenges him, with the loser having to give up all five of their stars. But Funai rejects his offer, asking the man with the three remaining cards to come out of hiding. However, Kaiji explains to him that no one is hiding and that the cards were flushed down the toilet earlier by the man who was taken away and punished. With that, Funai has no option but to accept. Putting their cards down, Kaiji has 
paper while Funai has Rock, giving the group a bona fide 5 extra stars and 10 in total. However, Kaiji and his gang only have 66 cards, meaning that even if they play amongst themselves, there will still be one person with one card left. So Kaiji volunteers to take the bait, but he has a plan. He'll give his stars to Ando and Furuhata, telling them to use them during the buy and sell period to get him out of there. But Kaiji doesn't realize that trusting them was his biggest mistake. And with that, they let the timer run out, and the Hellfire game officially ends. Kaiji then walks into the other room, where the losers are taken, just as the guards tell Kaiji here to take off his clothes, throwing him into a pitch black room where all the defeated men lay in wait for a fate worse than death, servitude. As Kaiji ponders if he made the right call, one of the naked men calls Kaiji over, where they can see through a one-way mirror into the gambling hall as they watch and wait. Suddenly, this old man here comes out and announces to the group that they have 10 minutes to buy and sell stars amongst each other, with the opportunity to save someone in the other room being a possibility. This is the only chance to save Kaiji, and with Ando and Furuhata being the only ones with stars, they're immediately swarmed by the remaining players. With money in hand, Furuhata then goes to save Kaiji, when suddenly, Ando has a change of heart, and tells Furuhata something diabolical, that he's not willing to get rid of the stars, or the money. Money. After explaining his logic, Angel Face Furuhata here suddenly agrees, selling off one of their stars for 5 million yen, effectively abandoning Kaiji naked and afraid in the other room. And this naked man here rubs it in his face, telling him that money is the only way to get out of this room alive. Kaiji then freaks out, attacking the man on the spot, and that's when the guards restrain him and hold him down. Realizing that the money in this guy's hands wasn't enough for him to be worth 3 stars, Kaiji then figures out that he must be holding something else either on his body or outside of the room for him to be worth saving. And that's when he reveals that he's holding two rings that were attached to the naked man on a bandage that Kaiji sneakily stole from him. Now, the naked man's friends have no option but to save Kaiji here instead, letting him go free, escaping by the skin of his teeth. Okay, Kaiji could have avoided this whole ordeal if he remembered the classic motto, think with your brain, not with your heart. These were two bad news from the start, and Kaiji should have had no reservation about beating them up and telling them to F off. Now, if it were me, I would criticize Kaiji's strategy of letting someone else go in first. He should have told one of them to take the bait and let one of them go into the other room instead. If I'm Kaiji, I'm the one that's been doing the heavy lifting, and I've been the one helping them every step of the way, and dare I say carrying the whole team. They should have no problem letting me take charge once again. Considering the fact that we just met Ando here, and the other one here is the stupid person that got us into this terrible situation in the first place. It's shouldn't be too out of the ordinary to think that one of these two is willing to betray us. Remember, Furuhata already ripped off Kaiji once before, so it's safe to say that he was bad news to begin with, but at least he had some cards for Kaiji to benefit off of. Unlike Ando, who was literally useless throughout the entire game and did not contribute a single thing to the group dynamic. It's a testament to Kaiji's character why he chose Ando to begin with, and it's this exact type of good nature on Kaiji's part that screwed him over. Throughout the matches, Kaiji had numerous chances to be betray him, but he didn't. Whereas Ando only needed one before he turned into a proper scumbag. Clearly Ando has his priorities right. Leaving the room, Kaiji walks like a guy with the biggest cojones in the room, and confronts the shit out of the now scared Ando and Furuhata, attacking them and taking one star from each and all of their money. Kaiji then notices a large crowd gathered around Funai, with the intent to buy his stars without any real cash. So then he butts in and puts down a fat stack of 8 million in cash, buying 3 stars and and saving his friend, this guy, from the other room. The first game is now finally over. However, Kaiji's debt has nearly multiplied to 6.295 million yen in debt, leaving him in a worse position than he was before. And with his low-paying job, it looks like all hope is lost for this young man. Kaiji goes back to the real world, and goes back to the same dead-end job, and gets fired on the same day. Later, after a Drown Your Sorrows Away session with his best friend, Kaiji walks home and notices a familiar face. It's the same detective from before, who congratulates him for beating the game, and tells him of another way to eliminate his new debt in a single night. All of Kaiji's troubles and Sahara's troubles can disappear forever if he joins the detective for another game. Q 
curious as hell and shit out of luck in life. The two men get a lift from the detective who informs them of a gambling party that will be held very soon and with little choice anywhere else. The two boys accept. The detective then gives them the time and place to meet him and the two prepare for their next horrifying game. Okay, the thinking behind this idea is terrible. While it might seem like there's no other option being millions of yen in debt, getting a good job and paying it off the normal way might be a viable option. If you've just entered a debt game where you've multiplied your debt, I would be thinking of more legitimate options to reduce the amount of debt I'd be needing to pay. If it were me, I would take this issue up with the local police instead of signing my life off to an evil corporation for the second time. Thinking of it this way, if we have knowledge of an underground gambling network where people are getting enslaved for years to come, there might be a good chance of getting the attention of the public's eye towards them and getting the evil corporation arrested. Everything done on that cruise ship was obviously illegal, and this next debt game is going to prove to be even more extreme than the last. And if you think about it, it's all just a matter of perspective. Kaiji's life might seem pretty damn depressing, and it is, and the debt that he's accrued is unlike any other. But at least he still has his eyes, ears, and fingers intact, right? Well, for now. After that whole debacle on the ship, I think it's time for Kaiji to come up with a real career in order to pay off his debt. The average minimum wage in Japan is 930 yen, or 8 US dollars per hour, which means that it's unlikely that he would be able to accrue the funds necessary to pay back his soul-crushing debt. If I was Kaiji, I would consider traveling overseas to work in a foreign country. Hear me out now. For example, it's common in Australia to recruit and give unskilled foreigners visas to perform manual labor jobs in the countryside, since these positions don't attract many any locals. This would also benefit Kaiji another way, by one, he doesn't receive any more visits from loan sharks because one, he'd literally be an ocean away from any of his past troubles. And after all, if he still can't pay off the debt, he can always just run away from his troubles and live off the grid in the outback with the kangaroos. Not a bad plan. The day of the game arrives, and so does Kaiji, stopping at a place called the Starside Hotel, where he meets the man Ishida, who he saved from the previous game, and his blonde friend Sahara. Gathering the 60 players, a suited man tells him that the games are about to begin, but he can only take 12 people at a time, equaling 5 groups. Volunteering to be in the first group, Kaiji, Ishida, Sahara, and 9 others are the first batch to head off not realizing that they're about to play with their lives. Entering another room, the 12 contestants are sent into vertical coffins, where they're taken to a different part of the tower. Suddenly, the coffins open, revealing a tiny set of bridges with upperclassmen down below betting on who will win. Shocked, no one knows what to do, when suddenly, number 5 here says screw it and goes first, falls to the wall and all in. He makes it halfway, but drops off and hits the ground, severely injuring himself. Now, everyone gains the courage to attempt the challenge. Walking across the bridge, Kaiji realizes that the only way to get into first place is to push the person in front of him off the bridge. Suddenly, he notices the man behind him gain enough courage to start walking across the bridge as well. However, the stakes are about to get even higher as the bridge below his feet is getting thinner by the second. Everyone is terrified to push each other off, but when one of the players manages to do it, the rest follow. With no other option, Kaiji tries to push number 11 off, but he can't manage to muster up the courage to do it. And and he's running out of time because suddenly the man behind him tries pushing him off. But in the scuffle, all three of them drop off the bridge. Either way, with their hands touching the bridge, they're disqualified, with Ishida and Sahara in first and second place. Whereas the rest of the contestants that didn't fall are taken to a back room. Okay, this is a major step up from the cruise ship, and the amount of fear everyone is experiencing is multiplied tenfold. While gaining millions of yen in debt sounds scary, I know, dropping 30 feet and suffering multiple injuries and even death is a lot worse. Now the strategy that Kaiji had for this one was terrible. There are no friends in this game, and as we saw with Andu and Furuhata, they'll do anything to survive, even if it includes betraying their own friends. No one here got into the situation they were in by being good people. And if they're willing to participate in an underground gambling competition that is illegal, I want to remind everyone to stay alive, there's a good chance that their moral compass isn't exactly the strongest either. Amazingly, everyone other than ourselves is the thinking it's either him or them, and that's it. If the only thing you have to do is to lightly help along gravity, do it. That person is going too slow. Survival of the fittest is the name of the game, and Kaiji needs to remember that if he wants to win.
Focusing on the challenge itself, the main way to win is to stay cool, calm, and collected. Balancing on a small steel beam for an extended period of time will challenge the core muscles, lower back, and legs to a great extent. And since Kaiji and everyone else here seems to be heavy smokers, they'll be quick to gas out and lose their cardiovascular endurance. So that means waiting for people to go in front of you is an absolutely terrible idea for everyone involved. Both of you are losing out on precious time you could instead be using to slowly inch your way along the bridge. And being the last one to cross would also not be the smartest option. Because while it might seem like an easy win to wait behind and then simply push everyone else off, this wouldn't work thanks to one very important law. Newton's third law. For every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And this will apply here. Because by pushing people out of the way, we'll be risking having the same amount of force being directed back at us, causing us to lose our balance in unpredictable ways. This is why going first was the ultimate move and the only one at that. With all the groups finishing their races, rewards are handed out to the first and second places of every group. Opening the envelope, Sahara here instead of cold cash finds a 20 million yen ticket inside. Furious, the winners complain, but the game master tells them to come outside. Since only one person from the fifth group came back, there's still a 10 million yen ticket to be won. And those who came third place or below also have the chance to win this very ticket. Out Outside, the contestants meet the same hallmaster from the cruise ship, Tonegawa, who congratulates them for their bravery and tells them that they only have two hours to exchange their tickets. However, there's a catch. The only way to exchange the tickets is to cross another tiny bridge of the same width as before, but this time there's no pushing or shoving. The only requirement to winning is to cross the bridge. Although this time, there's a few differences. The bridge is now electrocuted, so if you touch it with your hands, you'll be shocked. And last but not least, if you're disqualified in this game, the penalty is death. Suddenly, Kaiji agrees to participate, and eventually everyone follows. With a fatal 22-story drop, the next game begins. Going in order, Kaiji here draws a line on the center of everyone's foot to help them keep stable during the challenge. With an emotional rally, all 10 contestants finally head off, making their way across this horrifying bridge. Kaiji nearly slips, causing his heart to race dramatically, and it just keeps getting better and better because suddenly, strong winds start to blow, but in reality, it's all in their heads, a consequence of being scared out of their mind. The man in front of Kaiji then gives up, touching the bridge with his hands and gets brutally electrocuted, falling to his death. Shit has just gotten real. Death continues to fill the air because another man begins to run backwards, tripping and falling down to his death. The entire group begins to freak out, and that's when they ask the hallmaster to cut the power and end the game. However, this man is a brutal son of a bitch and declines their offer, stating that this bridge is a test to see whether or not their lives are truly worth living. Suddenly, another man hits the bridge like a crispy duck and falls off, and then people start dropping like overweight flies, leaving only Kaiji Ishida and Sahara. However, Ishida begins to lose balance, and knowing that he's about to fall, offers his 10 million yen ticket to give to his dead suffering wife and kids. Taking the ticket, Kaiji looks backwards and sees that he's nowhere to be found, meaning now only two remain. With a final push, Sahara barely manages to make it across, jumping the final few meters, and is greeted by a closed door with no handle. With people looking through the other side, laughing, he cautiously opens the door, but a dark surprise awaits for him. Suddenly, a strong gust of wind hits him, pushing him off the ledge and down to his death. Okay, okay, while it was a good idea at first, gathering the survivors together and increasing morale, it only works if everyone stays composed. The second that one of them lost their composure, everyone failed, and that's why all but two people managed to make it to the end. If the risk of losing is instant death, the right thing to do would be to quit the game and stay put. There's no amount of death that could compare to being dead. Now, Kaiji has some good ideas, but the Hallmaster was right all along. No amount of confidence matters when you're halfway through the bridge and you're completely terrified of dying at any second. Marking the middle of the shoes was a great idea, and it's a great way to keep balance and composure when you're making your way along the bridge. However, there's one bad thing about this. You'll have to be looking down at the bridge the whole time, and when you look down, you'll quickly realize how damn big the drop is, which might cause you to stress out more than you can handle. Furious, it looks like all hope is lost, when suddenly, a glass pathway appears from both sides of the bridges, but Kaiji doesn't trust nothing. Cautious as all hell, he slowly steps onto the platform, and he realizes that he's made it. 
A door then opens above and inside a number of suited men congratulate him for making it to the end. Suddenly, the hall master comes out and tells him that his tickets are void and that his request for cutting the power was actually accepted. However, the power took a little while to turn off, meaning that they played for nothing. Kaiji then loses his shit and tries to attack the hall master, saying that it was unfair to not have turned the power off straight away. This older man shrouded in darkness then comments, saying that he agrees with Kaiji's statement and that he deserves another chance. The older man then gets up and tells Kaiji of a game called E-Card, a game which will cost Kaiji everything he's got. Through this game, they'll be able to measure the true determination and will of Kaiji's resolve, with a prize total of 100 million yen. However, if he quits now, they state that they'll give him 5 million for his troubles. Agreeing, Kaiji decides to take the E-Card offer, but that was his biggest mistake. Taking an elevator downstairs, Kaiji accidentally steps on someone whilst walking in the dark. The lights then turn on and reveal that all the contestants who fell during the first game are all still in agonizing pain. Going into another room, the hallmaster sits down with Kaiji, who reveals himself as Kaiji's next opponent. The two of them will be playing a game called E-Card, and this is how it works. There's three types of cards, Citizen, Emperor, and Slave. In total, there are eight Citizen cards, and one of each Emperor and Slave. The deck of ten is split between two players, and each deck is played three times before reshuffling the cards. Once the game begins, each player puts down one card and flips them over. Whoever has the stronger card wins. Emperor beats Citizen. Citizen beats Slave, and Slave beats Emperor. If two players play the same card, it is a draw. After 12 hands, the game ends. But this seemingly relaxed game comes with terrifying consequences. Kaiji here has the option to either attach a drilling device into his eye or ear. Within 3 centimeters of drilling, the eye or eardrum will completely burst. However, Kaiji can use these 3 centimeters to bet on money, and each time he wins a bet in exchange for 1 millimeter of the drill, he'll be paid 100,000. That means if he bets one centimeter, he'll be paid one million yen, but if he loses enough games, he'll lose an eye or an ear in brutal fashion. However, these rules only apply to the side holding the emperor card. If you're holding the slave card, it's five times more. Furious, Kaiji has no option but to accept, and both players move to a different table, where the drilling device is attached to Kaiji's head, and the terrifying game commences. The hallmaster then asks Kaiji how much distance he wants to bet. With 30 millimeters of space between his ear drum left before any real damage by the drill can be done. That's where the limit is. To begin, Kaiji bets 10 millimeters, meaning that he'll get 1 million yen if he wins. At every round, the first side to go switches, with the first round being the emperor to go first, the second round being the slave to go first, and so on. Okay, this is definitely a game of psychology and there's not much to it, but just like in restricted rock, paper, scissors, the meat of the game is played outside of the card game. Now, this hallmaster has probably played this game hundreds of times before, and Kaiji here doesn't exactly have the upper hand. Considering the fact that there's a massive drill attached to his ear, which is going to make any sane person freak out, thinking logically the best way to survive and win the game intact is to exclusively bet 1mm drills every single time. Yeah, it draws things out, but I would prefer to keep my hearing, thank you very much. Having something stuck 10mm into your eyes would be enough to mess with your equilibrium, and that is only going to make the game more stressful than it has to be. At this point, things are looking really intense. If we're unlucky, losing the game might just mean death or permanent injury. However, something that might work in our favor is remembering what we just went through in the previous game. If we were to have lost that one, the risk is almost certainly instant death. Now, there's one more thing to mention. At the end, when Sahara was blown off and the glass bridge appeared, it was extremely dangerous to trust the game masters by jumping straight onto the platform. If it were me, I would try throwing my jacket onto it just to make sure it can take my weight. Glass is a flimsy material, and this corporation is the least trustworthy corporation in the whole of Japan. For all we know, the other door might be completely safe to go through, and the other contestants on the bridge were never meant to survive. Now, keeping a calm headspace during the game is key to tricking the Hallmaster into making a stupid decision by using techniques such as being mindful of in-the-moment thoughts and belly breathing, which involves breathing from the gut rather than the chest. And all of these techniques will ensure that Kaiji's thought processes remain at a steady, unflexed state. And this means knowing that the Hallmaster is probably an expert at this game and has the skills necessary to discern our body language down to a T. Because if he's played this before, then it's likely that he would know how to tell 
about what we have based on how we react. And changing our subconscious movements is not an option right now. Which means if I was Kaiichi, whatever card I think about placing, I would put down the exact opposite. Meaning if I thought that placing down the Emperor card in the first round was a good idea, then I'd assume that my opponent would have already deduced that I would do this. So I would go the completely opposite direction and place down a Citizen card instead. Now this tactic would not likely work for long, but it's a start to let us gain the upper hand and get some early wins in, because we cannot afford to lose. And judging from Kaiji's absurd bets, he's prepared to go balls to the wall for this game. Now, the games finally begin. In the first round, both players play it safe and put down the Citizen card, meaning it's a draw. Next up, the Hallmaster puts down a Civilian card, and Kaiji here puts down an Emperor, meaning Kaiji is the winner. During the next round, the exact same outcome happens, leaving Kaiji as the winner for two rounds straight. But the Hallmaster has some tricks up his sleeve. The next hand they play is a draw, leaving Kaiji with only three cards to use. Stressed, the Hallmaster can hear exactly what Kaiji here is thinking, leading him to play the slave card, while Kaiji plays the Emperor card, meaning Kaiji loses this round, and with that, the drill in his ear goes further in 10 millimeters. As the loser, Kaiji now has to play on the slave side, but this is where Kaiji's luck is about to take a turn for the worse. Kaiji, playing as the slave, puts in a 2 millimeter bet since the slave side has a much lower percent chance of winning. Playing a new hand, the Hallmaster puts down a citizen card, while Kaiji plays a slave card and loses, further causing the drill to extend another 2 millimeters into his ear. The next bet placed is 2 millimeters. Playing their next hands, the round is a draw. The Hallmaster then tells frustrated Kaiji that there's more to this game than meets the eye, telling him that reading and analyzing your opponent's desires is essential to winning. Using this knowledge, Kaiji next up places down a slave card as his next pick. However, it's all for nothing, as the Hallmaster plays a citizen card, making Kaiji lose once more, causing the drill to extend yet again a further 2 millimeters into Kaiji's ear as he drops down in pain. The next bet is placed, and this time, it's a whopping 10 millimeters. Surprised, the Hallmaster thinks closely about his next pick, as they both draw citizens. Next up, Kaiji puts down a citizen again, but the Hallmaster is too much for him, playing an Emperor. Defeated, Kaiji puts down 1 millimeter as his next bet, but again, the Hallmaster interrupts the game to remind Kaiji of what's causing him to lose, mentioning his posture as a clear sign of what card he's about to put down. But Kaiji doesn't believe a word that this guy says, and puts down an Emperor card. But it's all for nothing, because the Hallmaster plays Slave, making it 5 straight losses for Kaiji. Betting 1 millimeter again, Kaiji begins to freak out, as both players draw a Citizen card, resulting in a draw. Now, Kaiji only has one card left, meaning that he's already lost another round. Once again, the drill pierces closer to his eardrum, with only 4 millimeters left to go until it completely bursts. Playing again, the two pick Citizen as their cards of choice, which leads to another draw. Not knowing what to do next, Kaiji decides to play another Citizen card, and this time wins over the Hallmaster, and everyone begins to cheer him on. The President then scolds the Hallmaster for losing, telling him that losing is not an option. But for the next few rounds, Kaiji realizes that something is not right. Something or someone is revealing his cards to the Hallmaster, and he notices the Hallmaster's watch. It was flipped from earlier. Next, the Hallmaster plays Citizen, and Kaiji picks Slave, leading to another loss and one millimeter more lost as the drill extends further and further into his ear. Kaiji then realizes that something drastic has to be done to catch the Hallmaster off guard, and Kaiji then asks him how far the drill can actually go before stopping. The Hallmaster then tells Kaiji that the limit is 45 millimeters, meaning that Kaiji here has 18 millimeters left to bet. However, his life is now on the line. Taking a break in the restroom, one of the ex-players tries to convince Kaiji to not take the risk, but Kaiji refuses and asks the man for help in the upcoming rounds instead, because Kaiji has an idea. Suddenly, Kaiji starts banging his head against the mirror, trying to fool his ear device, because it's not just a drill, it's also a bodily monitor that sends feedback to the Hallmaster's watch. That's how he's reading Kaiji's cards. Kaiji takes things up a notch, and using a glass shard, he cuts into his ear, leaving the left side of his face completely bloodied. He then goes back into the hall and wagers a whopping 18 millimeter for the next round. It's all or nothing here. Balls to the wall. If Kaiji loses now, it could mean instant death. For the next round, the Hallmaster begins to notice his watch isn't sending accurate information anymore, but thinks little of it as both players put down citizens. But sure enough, Kaiji wins the next round with a slave card. And with the game nearing its end, he bets another 18 millimeters, shocking everybody. Kaiji then tells the Hallmaster to turn off his watch 
watch as the guards implant another drill into Kaiji's right ear. Now, the final hand of E-Card begins. Starting off, both players draw a tie, with Kaiji up next throwing down a card with a blood stain on it, causing the Hallmaster to realize that these must be the two cards used in the 11th hand, meaning that it is either a citizen or a slave. And both players draw a citizen. The Hallmaster begins to doubt this realization, knowing that there might be a possibility of the card having been washed or bloodied already. He doesn't know if Kaiji knows what he knows, or if Kaiji truly did slip up. Next, they both throw down a citizen, meaning the next bloodstained card is a slave. But the Hallmaster quickly begins to doubt his crazy theories, and that Kaiji's card may have already been cleaned of blood. After Kaiji throws down another bloodstained card, catching the eye of the Hallmaster, who now knows that it must be a slave card. But something is not right. The Hallmaster hesitates, so in a last Hail Mary attempt, throws down an Emperor card, and Kaiji reveals his final card. It's a slave. Kaiji wins the final round of E-Card. However, at 5 wins to 7 losses, Kaiji's technically the loser, but the money he won says otherwise. And his reward for winning is 20.1 million yen. Okay, now, even though Kaiji won, there's a good chance that the drill implanted into his ear has already done damage, costing him more than he should have if he had been it without the drill going in as deep as it did. The moment he noticed the guys thinking outside of the box, he should have taken some sneaky actions of his own to ensure his success and stick it to the man. Looking across the room, we can see that there's a group of people rooting Kaiji on, hoping for him to beat the Hall Master. Now, if it were me, there's a small little trick that could be used to potentially win a round or two. While it might not win us the game, if anything, it's going to put us in a better chance of position and increase our odds of success. And anything that's going to achieve that is essential. I would take a bathroom break with the other guys and let them in on the plan to ensure that we steal a round. What I would do is tell one of the guys to look closely at the cards the Hall Master has. Then we could use some kind of secret code to let myself in on what kind of card he's about to use. For example, if the Hallmaster is about to use a slave card, then someone in the back could scratch the left side of their face, and if it's a citizen, scratch the opposite side. Something simple like this could be a great way of catching the Hallmaster off guard early or using it to gain momentum back when things are looking bad. And Kaiji's done well in betting exorbitant amounts of money, because contrary to what it seems, this is actually the correct methodology to follow, because as previously stated, the odds for victory playing the slave side are only four times lower than playing for the Emperor's side, meaning it's almost certain that the longer the game will last, the more the Hallmaster will have an advantage. As a punishment for losing, the President then reveals a terrifying device. The Hallmaster must kneel on a flaming hot surface on the ground for 10 seconds to show that he's truly sorry. And with no option, he steps onto the grill, head to ground for the full 10 seconds, and he burns to a crisp. In the bathroom, Kaiji tells the ex-players that the games are not over. Seeing what just happened, Kaiji realizes that the Hallmaster was simply a puppet it is the president who is the evil one in control. But the gang thinks nothing of it and congratulate him for all that he's done when he accidentally steps on a tissue box. And that's when it hits him. There's a way to defeat the president. Using the tissue box, Kaiji realizes that he can slip paper into one side and out the other, leading to an interesting idea as to how he'll challenge the president. Using both the tissue box and some paper, he plans to challenge the president into a lottery, with the tickets being 50 to 60 folded up tissues, with one being marked with a circle indicating the winning ticket. However, Kaiji plans to rig the lottery by putting the winning ticket into the gap of each tissue box before they start. However, his plan starts to fall apart when he realizes there's two types of boxes, with the other being much more firmly glued together. Deciding to leave those as is, Kaiji leaves the bathroom, challenging the president to a new bet, and one that will cost Kaiji everything. The president accepts Kaiji's new game as he prepares it, just as a guard goes to get a tissue box, with both of them inspecting it before the game begins. Begins. But the president stops Kaiji and proposes three rules to make the game more interesting. Firstly, the winning ticket has to be in good condition or else it could be tampered with. Secondly, both players have to roll up their sleeves when drawing from the box, spreading their fingers when inside of it. The president also asks to go first. And thirdly, the president bets a wager of 100 million. And since Kaiji doesn't have more money to wager, the president simply bets Kaiji's four fingers, meaning if he loses, the president gets to cut them off. Okay. Okay, if it were me, this actually wouldn't be too bad of a risk to take. Not only is the risk for this game non-life-threatening, if we win, that means we'll be set for life. However, Kaiji here completely messed up by not considering every possible last way of cheating until the very end. Considering the fact that he thought of an elaborate plan to cheat the game and beat the president, he should have realized that the president would be planning something as well. This president isn't dumb. If he connected the dots, he would have known that the cheating hallmaster Tonegawa learned everything he knows from the president himself, making him the most 
most formidable foe Kaiji's ever faced. He knows that these people are willing to do the most savage things to stay alive, and even if they win, there's a good chance that they'll create another rule to keep the money. And while it might seem like a slightly risky gamble, the fact that the president goes first, no questions asked, is an instant red flag and one that's going to cost Kaiji an arm and a leg. Regardless of him declining to play rock, paper, scissors to decide who goes first, he should have insisted they do so. Not only does it make the game fair, since Kaiji beat the Hallmaster in e-card fair and square, if the president completely shuts him down, Kaiji here still has 20 million yen in the bank, minus the debt and hospital expenses of course. The final game begins and the guards do the rest and shuffle the box. What the president doesn't realize is that there's another hidden ticket right inside. The president goes first, drawing an empty ticket, and Kaiji is next up to go, but has a terrifying realization that the hidden winning ticket is not there. It's been moved. Kaiji's face draws pale as he now realizes that him winning all will come down to pure dumb luck. Kaiji takes out a losing ticket as he watches the president stick his fingers in to find the winning ticket. Kaiji has just lost his money and his fingers. Accepting defeat, the president congratulates Kaiji on his bravery and hands him the winning ticket as a gesture. Asking his name, the president reveals himself as Hyodo, just as he readies to slice off Kaiji's fingers. Hours later, Kaiji sits, defeated and fingerless, right as the ex-players confront him with the tissue box, showing that all the tickets had been removed. But suddenly, they find a crumpled up piece of winning ticket paper, realizing that the president must have found it and crumpled it in the first round meaning he knew exactly where the winning ticket was this whole time. Kaiji then beats himself up for not realizing this sooner, but stands up tall and resolved, determined to find Hyoto once more at some point to settle the score once and for all. But what do you think? How would you beat Kaiji? Go check out our channel How to Beat Anime for more videos like this.